I'm going to, uh, in a moment, I will share a screen with you all, with a few sources. <clears throat> There are many topics that one can speak about with regards to Puri. Today, I want to address the, the fundamental question of how, how a new how comes about, how a new day in the Jewish calendar ent enters into the Torah, into, into the halachic system. How, does, how do such things work? And do they happen in a smooth, seamless fashion, or is it perhaps frequently a question of uh, some dissension and, and argument, at least at the beginning. So without further ado, I'm going to... Uh, ah, I don't, I don't think I can, I can share a screen with you. I think only the host can share a screen with you. Um, um, Achi Hood, you are able to allow him to do that. Achi Hood, are you there? Can. Can you please give me permission to share a screen? Um, yeah, hold on. <clears throat> Can I share the screen now? I think so. Try. Very well. I shall indeed try. No, nope. it says host disabled participant screen share. Now try. Yes, that looks good. All right, can, uh, can everyone now see a screen with some sources? Purim, Hazon, wa Te'uzal Hadesh, wa Torah, the Purim paradigm, the vision and daring to innovate. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> Excellent. Very well. So we find in the Talmud Bavli, Magila, Tavzain Amud Alet, we find the following statement. Tamarab Shemuel Bar Yuda, Batahila, Initially, Purim was only celebrated or enacted in or celebrated. It's not entirely clear how one should understand that term. In Shushan, in the capital city of the Persian Empire at that time. But eventually, Purim was accepted throughout the Jewish world. And there on the same daf we find the, ne the following statement, that is one Beth in front of you on the sheet. So sheet, Amar Rav Shemuel Bar Yehuda, Shalaha lahem Esther lahachamim. Esther Amalka sent to the Hachamim. Apparently, this refers to the Hachamim at that time in Eretz Yisrael. Kivaruni leVaruf. Literally, establish me or fix me or enact me for all. Generation. So, in other words, as a permanent fixture in in Torah Judaism, there should there should not be a an event that is celebrated just now, just this year, or just next year, when people still when the memory is still fresh, but rather it should be celebrated for all time. <clears throat> Rashi explains there kuvaoni leyom tov lekriya to make this into a special day yom tov. A day of celebration, of feasting, and a day of reading, the Merila, that is to say. How did the Hachamim respond? Shalahula. Khina at Oredet Alenu Levenha Umov. 
you are going to cause animosity between us and the Goyim. We, at this time, of course, the Jewish people, some of whom, but only a relatively small number, were in Eretz Israel, having been allowed to return uh, something like perhaps three generations earlier to Eretz Israel by Koresh. So there were some Jews in Eretz Israel. Most Jews were still in Chutz Laaretz, and both the Jews in Chutz Laaretz and in Eretz Israel were constantly under threat or there was definitely tension, tension between the, the Jews wherever they lived and their non-Jewish neighbors. And in fact, that is the, the underlying and uh, generally not understood story of Purim, as, as I will mention a bit later. <clears throat> so you're going to cause trouble. So we, we should perhaps not do this. That was what the Hachamim said to Esther. Esther replied, She said, that's not going to work. Everyone knows about this story. Everyone knows what happened because it is recorded in the, in the royal records and archives of the Persian Empire. What, of course, was the, was the issue? These hachamim, or some of them, those who responded to her in this vein, felt that the story of Jews rising up as an armed force and uh, fighting and killing and destroying their enemies, this was not good press for the Jews. This would not engender uh, positive relations with, with other nations, with other people ethnic groups, and keep in mind the Persian Empire was an empire with uh, a myriad ethnic groups within it. It wasn't even a question of a majority Persian nation and uh, a few minorities. It was a very widespread empire with many, many nations and creeds and religions, and therefore also many tensions. There were, there were great tensions between these groups and the Jews particularly had their own, their own political uh, issues with their neighbors, particularly because of the return of some of the Jewish people to Eretz Israel. And if this sounds familiar to you from more recent history, uh, then you're not mistaken. It's very much reminiscent of what we are familiar with from our own times or from the last few generations. But this is going back nearly two and a half thousand years. So Esther said to them, this is not a good idea. Uh, I'm sorry, they said to her, this is not a good idea. And she said, uh, if you're trying to keep things under wraps and uh, avoid this getting into the press, into the public domain, that's not going to happen. It's already well known and everyone knows it. It's, everyone's heard about it. And that's... That's a very poor excuse. In other words, in simple terms, she, she did not accept their, their response and their, their claim and their, their fear. She did not share their fear. The next source, at the end of number one, Gimel, it says there on the same daf, Shalahalahem Esther Lahachamim. She further wrote to them and said, which means, I want these events of Purim to be officially accepted as part of the, either as part of the canon, that is to say, part of the Tanakh, although that was not entirely, it's not entirely clear that is what happened because we find in the, in the Talmud much, much later that even Shemuel Bavli did not regard Merilah Esther to be Metamet Yadain. In other words, he did not regard the Merilah as part of the Tanakh. It's something that you have to read on Purim, but it was not, in his view, part of the Tanakh. It was not one of the Kitra uh, Kodesh. At any rate, 
she said this has to become an official document that the Jews read and has to be written down in a fixed text, fixed nusach, a fixed uh, redaction of these events has to exist in order to perpetuate the memory of these events. And again, what did they reply? Shalahula, we're not really in favor of this. We, can't, we cannot accept this request of yours or this demand. Halo chathavti lecha, the Pasuk says in Mishlei, Shalishim, the Mo'iso, wa da'af. This Pasuk in Mishlei is explained in, in this drasha as follows. Shalishim, walori ba'in. This concept of Amalek, of Mihyat Amalek, which is one of the central themes of Purim, and that is why we just read Parashat Zahor. We read Parashat Zahor Davka before Samuch Lefurim, because there is a, an intrinsic and very significant connection between these two things. This concept of Mehyat Amalek should uh, be written in three places, but we do not find a source, a basis for it to be written in four places. Ad Shemosa'ula Mikra Kathuba Torah, until they noticed that the Pasuk in the Torah says in Sefer Shemot, Perek Yitzayim, the end of Parashat Vashalah, Kathov Zot Zikaron Basefer, and they would doresh this Pasuk in the following way, Kathov Zot Mashe Kathuv Khan, that which is written here in Sefer Shemot, Uv Mishne Torah, there we also find, in Mishne Torah, we find uh, the end of Parashat Ki Tese, the, uh, what we read on Parashat Zachor, Parashat Zachor at Hashem Asal Lecha Amalek, Zikaron, the, the other word in the Pasuk here in Shemot, Mashe Katuv Banevim, this refers to what we find in, in Sefer uh, with regards to Shaul Amalek, who was instructed by Shemuel and Navi to attack Amalek, the capital city of Amalek, Amalek, Ir Amalek. Basefer, Mashe Katuv Banevila. So we find three, there are three terms, Kethov, Zoth, Zikaron, and Sefer. And therefore they eventually, they acquiesced to write, a, 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 have a Merila written and accepted by them and given their stamp of approval, that this would be the official record of these events and it should, must be written, uh, I'm sorry, must be read and heard by all Jews every, every year. Now, if you look at these three statements on the same daf, the same amud in, in the Gemara, what do you see? You see that the acceptance of this new fangled chag, you could say, this new idea of Purim, which had never existed, was not such a, was not such a simple matter. It did not happen overnight, and it was not readily accepted by all, including not all the hachamim, by any means, were eager to make this into a, a, a Chag Kavua, a fixed event in the Jewish calendar with religious ramifications and, uh, and ideological ramifications. It was not something that everyone, uh, not everyone warmed to the idea immediately. That's, that is what Shmuel ba, Rav Shmuel Bar Yudah says, b'shushan. this is where Mordechai and Esther uh, were in charge because they were, they could send out decrees from the palace. But the rest of the world, the rest of, rest of the Jewish world, it took time. Then we find that when Esther wrote to the Chachamim, they were very reluctant. And when she said to them, again, they were reluctant. It took some doing until this concept and this new new Chag was accepted. Now the truth is that all of this is hinted at, if not perhaps even explicit, in the Merila itself. Towards the end of the Merila, Perek Teth, chapter 9, as you see here in source number 2, we find, we read as follows, Vayichtov Mordechai, Ad HaDevarim Ho'ele, Vayishlach Sefarim Al Kol HaYehudim, Asher Bechol Medinot HaMelech HaHashverosh, he wrote, Mordechai wrote, again, he was writing with the, with the, the uh, authority and under the royal seal. So he was writing with the authority of the king. 
that they should accept upon themselves to do what? To keep the 14th day of Adar, and the 15th, that they should celebrate and commemorate this, these events on these two days every year. These days, to celebrate them and commemorate them, you may mishta was days of celebration and feasting. To send and which uh, mishtes is we, from the word mishta we learn the, the inyan of of Sudaf Purim and Mishlah Manot and Matanot Levim. We chibbel ha-Yehudim et ha-Sher ha-Helul ha-Asot and the Jews accepted this as a uh, overriding and uh, overriding halachic principle. In other words, not just something that we're doing now because we chose to do it. This is now part of the Torah, part of the halacha. Et ha-Sher ha-Helul ha-Asot they began to do it as a kind of minhag, as a kind of rishut but this became now, uh, Mordechai wanted it to become a, a miswa, another mis- a new miswa in the Torah. And this is how it is listed by, by some of the monem miswa, some of the early uh, hachamim who list the Taryag, the 613 miswa. Purim is the, the and the Merila is, are, the, are the first example of, of uh, miswa in the verse of Purim. From the Chachomim and not from the Torah. And then it goes on to say, Vatichtov Aster Hamalka Vat Avichail, O Mordechai Yudi, Ef Kol Tokhet. Now it says that not only did Mordechai write, but Esther Hamalka, and she was even more senior than Mordechai in terms of her position in the royal household, they wrote Kol Tokhet. Now the word Tokhet here means that this was a royal decree. The people could not easily refuse. In other words, Esther and Mordechai were using their political clout, their position in the Persian Empire, to get the Jews to follow what they were saying. The Kayemet in Geret Hapurim Hazov Hashenit. Vaishlah, we'll see what that means in a moment. Vaishlah Sefarim and Kola Yudim, and therefore this was sent out to all the Jews. El Sheva were Esrim. So letters were sent out to all the Jews in all the various provinces of the empire to celebrate these days and to keep them every year. As was as was they were instructed and essentially uh, forced by Mordechai and Esther to do. It was the word and the decree of Esther that made this a reality. Those are the words that we read in the Mughila. What do they mean? What do we have to understand from all of this? Rashi explains as follows. In, we, we, I divided the text here into two paragraphs. At the beginning, it spoke about Mordechai, and then it spoke about, about Esther. Rashi says, In other words, Mordechai wrote this Merila, the Merila of Esther that we read every year. And then when it speaks about the in the second paragraph, <laughs> that Esther and, you, and Mordechai together wrote a second time, Rashi says, What does that tell you? What do you understand from that? Why do they have to write a second time? <laughs> Clearly, I believe, because there was opposition and they saw that not all the Jews wanted to do this and there were hachamim apparently who opposed this idea. As we saw before, at least some of the Hachamim, my, est- my estimation is that at first, a majority of the Hachamim were opposed to this whole concept of a new Chag and this celebration of Purim. And therefore, they felt they had to send the second year 
to insist and to emphasize this is not just for this year, this is for all years. That's what Rashi said. Rabbi Avraham ibn Ezra writes not something different. In other words, he doesn't say anything that disagrees with Rashi, but I think he's much more specific and much more focused on, on the true import of these Pesukim that we just read. Rabbi Avraham ibn Ezra says, This is the first paragraph that I mentioned above. Lekayim by himself first. Lekayim b'shana ba'a. Uch kol ha'shanim simhat yemei ha'purim. Initially, Mordechai wrote. And and so therefore, Wa'ikhto Mordechai, it does not refer necessarily, according to of the Pirush of Ibn Ezra, does not refer necessarily to the text of the Murila, but he wrote a decree, he published a decree that the Jews should celebrate Purim. And then in the second paragraph, as we saw, both Esther, now Esther joined Mordechai to back him up, to give it more authority. And they wrote a second time, and they wrote, Et kol tokef. The word tokef means with all the full force of the law. Et kol tokef, Rash, uh, the Ibn Ezra writes, Kemo hozek, v'chamo im yitkifu ha'ehad, v'hine kethava hi v'hu. They wrote together, both of them. And he goes on to say, at the end of the, we read at the end of these Prisokim, Um, in the second paragraph, we read that in the second line, letters of this decree, copies of this decree were sent out to all the provinces of the Persian Empire. What does that mean? Abraham ibn Ezra says, Why does it say? Initially, they accepted to do this. It was maybe even intuitive to them that they should celebrate and thank Hashem for what happened, but that it should become a, a new religious obligation of Niswa for all time, for their children and grandchildren, for all generations of Jews, for all time. This was not obvious to them, as it was to Mordechai and apparently to Esther, but I think Mordechai was the real instigator of this. <laughs> and the proof that this is the correct understanding. In other words, when it says, shalom, wa emeth. Emeth means he told them what they are required to do, and he made it also a, a royal decree, but he also explained to them why it should be done. Umamar is there, and we, we read at the, at the end of the, the second paragraph, the last line. Umamar is there, Qiyam divrea purim ha'elem. What does that mean? That the, the words of Esther brought it into existence or made it fixed. Ibn Ezra explains, It did not take hold. It did not gain traction with the Jews. And I think we can also add that with the Hachamim. Initially, it was opposed. And there was probably quite some mahloket about this, as I would explain presently. And initially, Mordechai by himself did not have sufficient authority to enact Purim for all time. But the royal decree, the additional decree of and seal of Esther as queen, this made it happen. This made it what it became, what it actually, what, what Purim actually uh, became as we know it today. It was the act of Esther in the final analysis that brought, made this a reality. That's what, that's what the Pasuk says according to Ibn Ezra. And I think that's the simple Peshat of, of the, of the Mechila. Now, do we find any hint of such discussions in other sources in Hazal? The answer is most definitely yes. In source number three, can I assume that everyone is able to see the uh, screen? Number three? Yes? 
Everyone with me? Everyone can hear me? Yes? Yes, I can hear you and the, the um, sources are very clearly uh, visible. If you could zoom in a little bit, I think that would be helpful. On the screen? Yeah, Maybe meaning to make the text a little bit larger. I, I can try and do that, I think, just a moment. You, can do, just that on your, you can do that on your screen yourself like click on the yeah, mouse there you go. Like, oh that's 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 wonderful thank that's you good? okay wonderful very well okay so the next source number three is from the Talmud Yerushalmi in Masechet Merila where it states as follows Rabbi Yirmiya B'Shem Rabbi Shemuel Barav Yishak Ma'asu Mardukhai Wa'ester what exactly did these two pivotal figures in, in our history and certainly in, in with regards to the history of Purim, what did they do exactly? They wrote a letter, and they sent it to the Hachamim, to our teachers. It should say, I think, halalu, that Yud is probably a tough so fair mistake. They wrote to the Hachamim and said, Do you accept? this concept, this idea, this decree of ours that these days become fixed events that all Jews will celebrate every year. Amrulahem, they said to them, no, we're not really in favor of this at all. Do we not have enough tzoros? You can just imagine the, <laughs> the Rabbanim uh, pulling their beards and saying this and writing to back responding to Mordechai Wester, don't we have enough trouble? You want to call it, cause more trouble? You want to give the Goyim roundabout more reason to dislike us, to despise us, to plot against us? And we know from from uh, Sefer Ezra and Sefer Nehemiah that the Goyim roundabout in Eretz Yisrael and around Eretz Yisrael, where the, the Jews who returned from the Galuth had settled, were very displeased, to put it mildly, with the return of these Jews. They had hoped that they had seen the last of the Jews in Eretz Yisrael, and, uh, and they, of course, had, in the interim, they had taken over all the fields and the houses and the property, and it's very inconvenient when the, these Jews who are not, no longer supposed to be here all of a sudden show up and say, excuse me, this is ours, this is mine, this used to be my great-grandfather's field or something like that. And again, if you feel that this is some way, in some way reminiscent of more recent events, again, you're not wrong at all. History does indeed repeat itself. <coughs> excuse me. So... Mordechai Nestor wrote a second time. Hazaru bechatavu lahem igerat shenia. Hadahi dichtim. That is what is referred to in the pasuk. Lekayem alehem et igerat haporim hazot hashenith. So here again, just as we saw from the pasukim themselves in in Sefer Esther, in number two, and as we understood from the Perush of Rabbi Avraham ibn Ezra, we understand here also in the Talmud Yerushalmi, essentially we have further corroboration of what Rabbi Avraham ibn Ezra wrote, that they had to write twice to the Hachamim to insist that they accept this idea. Mahaya Kathufba, what did they write? Amrulahem, im midavar zem, midavar if you are concerned about <clears throat> about the goyim and their their hatred towards us, and this will only uh, cause more animosity and friction and, and hatred towards the Jews. <laughs> the word archim is like the word archive. In other words, it's already well known, as the Megillah states. It's written in the official archives, and this, the Megillah records this. <laughs> referring to Hashverosh. And the well-known story of the rise of Mordechai, that the Melech, the king, Ahasuerus, promoted and made into a central figure in the uh, 
in the government. You cannot hide these things. Everyone knows it. So here too, in, in as we understood from the Tamud Bavli before, we see here the same, the same uh, record, the same story being re- reported here in, in the Tamud Yerushalmi, and therefore we find that it continues, and it says, Rabbi Shmuel ban Nachman b'Shem Rabbi Yonatan, Shemonim v'Hamishah Zekhenim u'Mehem Shiloshim v'Chavan Nevi'im, a group, a Beth Din. Sanhedrin of, of 85 Hachamim, and amongst them over 30 who were on the level of having Ruach HaKodesh. They're referred to here as Nevi'im. Hayu mista'arim ala davarazeh. What do you mean they were mista'arim? They were very unhappy with this idea. What, what a particular idea. It's very clear. It says precisely, Amru, Kethiv, Eleham Miswot. It says in the Pasuk, these are the miswoth, I shall see what the night Moshe, Albanay Israel. The miswoth we know, they're in the Torah, and those are the miswoth that, that as Jews we are required to observe. Bahar Sinai. Elua miswoth, Shinistawino mi pi Moshe. These are the miswoth we were taught and told and commanded to do by Moshe. Kachamardlan, this is what he told us. We, this is our tradition. We've always known that this is how the Torah works. Moshe said, En novi aher afiv la hadesh lachem davar me'ata. There will not be another Navi in the future who will uh, add or change, add to the Torah or change the Torah that I'm giving you. This Torah is for all time. And you, Mordechai Nester, Mevakshim, Lahadesh, Lanu Davar, and you suggest a new Miswa be added to, to the Torah, to Yahadut. Are you, what are you, reform, reform Jews? You're trying to uh, change this essential tenet of Torah Judaism. This, of course, is exactly what we saw before, earlier in the, in the source number one from the Tawud Bavli. <clears throat> when there in the Tawud Bavli, the the formulation of these discussions and these these uh, letters backwards and forwards is sl- slightly different, but the the import is the same. When Esther said to them in one Gimel. Make it so that this becomes a, an official document that the Jews will read. The Mechila will be something that Jews will know and will read every year. It says that they were not uh, not immediately for this idea at all until they were able to find this Pasuk, as we explained before. Here we see the same thing and even more plainly expressed in the Tamud Yerushalmi. They said... You can't just come along and add something to the Torah like that. Uh, it's not, that's not the, the, the Torah that we know, that, that we have learned and taught. So you want to Mahadesh? That's not, that's not how we do things. Nevertheless, Yerushalmi continues, Lo zazu misham, no no davar, ad baruch In other words, nevertheless, they were unable to, to drop the matter. And I will add here, they were unable to drop it because Mordechai and Esther particularly uh, did not allow them, allow them to drop it. They forced them to, to, to discuss and consider the matter until eventually they would agree. Um, and, 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 and until Hashem opened their eyes, and they found Pesukim, in the Tanakh, in the Torah, the Nevim, and, and the Ketuvim, to back up this idea of a, a new event and uh, a new text in, in the Jewish world connected to, connected to uh, Amalek. Hadahi dikhtiv, vayomer Adonai Moshe, ketov zot zikaron basefer, again, the same pasuk that the Tamud Bavli mentioned, zot Torah, kamod the thema was zot, as it says in the Pasuk, Zoth HaTorah Shosha Moshe Lifne B'nei Yisrael. Zikaron. That is also a term that appears there in the Pasuk in the end of, at the end of Sefer B'Shalach, when after the initial war with Amalek. Elu HaNevi'im. As it says, Az Nidbaru Yirei Adonai Ish El Ra'ehu Ha'akshem Adonai Wa Yishma' Wa Yikathev Sefer Zikaron 
lefano lirei Adonai ulehoshe beshemo. So it talks about Sefer Zikaron. This is in the Nevi'im. Basefer, it says in the pasuk there in Beshalah ketod zot Zikaron. Basefer elu haketuvim. In other words, we we can learn from here that there should also be a text in the Ketuvim, in the third section of the Tanakh, and according to this Darasha, it is, the Merila is part of the Tanakh, Umamar Esther Qiyam, Divrei Purim Ha'ela, Wenichtav Basefer. In other words, again, we see that the Hachamim, or at least some of them, probably, I think many of them, probably a majority of them initially, were very reluctant to accept this idea of of establishing a new hug, a new festival, and a new uh, sefer, a new merila that should be read by the Jews, and something that should be celebrated every year. This was not something which immediately found favor with them, and it took some time. And I imagine there was a discussion and a mahloket among, amongst various chachamim. Mordechai was probably the leader of one camp, one uh, Beth Midrash amongst the Hachamim, and there were others who, who thought that Mordechai was too much of a Hadshan, too much of a, a uh, an original thinker, someone who was willing to uh, do and say things that others before him had not done and said. And therefore, it was discussed and probably discussed for a long time. It doesn't say here how long it took for all these discussions and the eventual consensus that uh, eventuated, it doesn't say here how long all this process took. My guess would be that it was a, a matter of some generations even. We of course are living so long and so far removed from these events that it's impossible for us to imagine that there would have been a mahloka, whether you should celebrate Purim this year on Yudal Biyar, I'm sorry, or Ba'adar, or Tethwal Ba'adar or not. But I think at that time, from what we see here, this was definitely a very real discussion, a very real mahloket between various hashkafoth, various points of view, different rabbanim and gavolim did not agree about this. And, but Mordechai and Esther had a very different view, and they had the upper hand because they were they were also able to apply pressure as as agents of the of the palace of the of the uh, Persian emperor. And this is what we see, I believe. <clears throat> the fact that there was such a mahlokir, that not, not everyone was happy with Mordechai and his suggestions and his ideas, which we know today as the Miswa of Kiryat Merila, reading the Merila, and what we know today as celebrating Purim. Not all the Hachamim were really uh, with this program at all. And this is what we, what we find, I believe, in the Tamud Bavli, Mechila Dav Tetzayin, source number four. It says, Ki Mordechai HaYehudi, Mishneh Lamelech HaHashverosh, V'Gadol LaYehudim, V'Rasui L'Rov Ehau. Now the simple chat of the of this term, V'Rasui L'Rov Ehau, in other words, Peshuto Shel Mikra is uh, the, the, the vast, uh, huge number. In other words, Rov is like Ribui Ehau. In other words, it doesn't mean a majority as opposed to a minority who also existed who were less uh, happy with Mordechai. That's not the pshat. The pshat is uh, to all of the, the Jews and all their huge numbers, they were all for, for and, and with Mordechai. But in, we know that in uh, Lashon Torah Lahod and Lashon Hachamim Lahod, the language of the Torah and the Tanakh is not always synonymous and identical with the language of Hazal. In Hazal, the term rov means majority, as it does in modern Hebrew today as well, where you talk about a mahloket, rov posekim say this, and miut posekim say this. We're talking about a majority and a minority. Rov ehau, velo chol ehau, that is a drasha here in the Talmud Bavli Daf Tetzayin, that he was liked and, and he uh, was followed by most of his brethren, most of the Jews, but not all of them. What does the Gemara say based on this? Melamed, from here we learn, Shepereshu Mimenu, Miksaf Sanhedrin, that some of the Hachamim literally 
separated themselves or broke away from him. They had a rift with him. There was a rift. There was a mahloket, a very serious mahloket. In other words, what we're hearing here is are the echoes from two and a half, almost two and a half thousand years ago, a bit less, maybe 2,470 years ago or something like that. We are hearing here the distant echoes of a very major discussion and mahloket in the Jewish world amongst the hachamim, and one imagines also amongst the Jews themselves, because some Jews obviously would have followed this group of Chachamim, and others follow the other group of Chachamim. And just as we know today, Jews have plenty to argue about. We all know that Jews are an argumentative people, and uh, Machlokis is not a new thing, and it existed in, the, in those times as well. And here, there was a Machlokis about, about Mordechai, his ideas, his suggestion, his uh, approach that in, in Yahadut there is room for, for certain changes in Hidushim. Everything, of course, according to the Torah, according to the spirit of the Torah, and even according to the letter of the Torah, as we saw, all these things were eventually given a seal of approval based on a drasha of various pesukim. But there was also this reality for a time, at least in his day, in his lifetime, according to this statement in the Talmud Bavli, that uh, not everyone agreed and accepted Mordechai's position and and uh, his his hashkafa, his, his uh, Torah outlook. And Rashi explains here, per, mimenu. <coughs> Rashi's explanation is Naniyuf Da'ati is not the the chat of what the the, the memra the statement of the Talmud uh, comes to tell us the chat I think is what I just explained Rashi says Perushumimenu they were un, unhappy with him and and displeased with him lefishe batal midivrei Torah v'nichnas lisrara because literally because he he spent less time studying Torah and uh, was involved in if you want to call it politics, or, or um, how should we put it, Being, it was involved with the, with the government and uh, and uh, matters of state, affairs of state. One of the proofs I think that one can bring for my understanding of that statement of the Talmud Bavli which is not exactly what Rashi explained now, even though in the words of Rashi, you can also find a hint of what I'm saying, because Rashi says that the perisha, the displeasure of some of the Chachamim with, with Mordechai, had to do with the fact that it has to do with something to do with Mordechai and the Torah, shall we say. What I, what I suggested was that because of his, his demands and his halachic approach, his approach to the Torah and the fact that this is something that can and must be done, and this was not accepted or considered correct by all, that, that was, I think, what the Mahloka was about. One of the reasons I think one can further proof for this understanding is what we find in another statement in the Talmud Babli, but this time in Masechet Sanhedrin, Dav Kov Zayin. There we find this, a, a similar statement about when the Sanhedrin is displeased with someone because they think his behavior or his his attitude or his actions are incorrect. This is explained, or this is stated in the Talmud in these terms, that the Sanhedrin was poresh mimenu. Where do we see this? With regards to David HaMelech. When David HaMelech sinned, Amarav Yudha Marav, Shisha Hodashim Nistara David, Nistara Laka Hemenu Shekhina, Uferashu Mimenu Sanhedrin. There is certainly referring to the fact that the Sanhedrin were expressing their displeasure with, with the with Amalek's behavior. And we have other statements in, in Chazal which indicate that uh, it was not a, not a simple matter for for many people to accept the fact that the with Amalek had sinned and had also done Teshuvah, and he was constantly reminded of his, his behavior. This, we see at least from here that the term lifrosh, when the Sanhedrin is poresh, when it turns away from someone, when it uh, doesn't want to have anything to do with him, 
this is an ex expression of displeasure because of a person's actions and and uh, and or ideas in this case in the case of Mordechai I think it's because of his ideas and also his actions in uh, in terms of demanding that this hug be instituted so to sum up what we've seen we see here that Mordechai and Esther as is written in Furash I think in the Megila and was as explained with Furash by Rabbi Abraham ibn Ezra uh, and this last line here on the, on the first page of, of these sources Rabbi Abraham ibn Ezra wrote where he now learned Kayem Aliyad Mordechai Levado Purim would not have happened would not have become what it did become by the actions and by the direction of Mordechai alone Ad Shek Ketava Esther it was Esther's uh, royal seal of approval and her insistence also that eventually carried the day and as I suggested before it took some time I'm, I'm quite uh, I think it's quite reasonable to assume that this discussion did not take place over the period of a week or a month or even a year but rather many many years in fact until it became accepted by all that, that this this is the uh, correct and uh, proper uh, approach and an halachic stance and eventually was accepted by all, all the Chachamim and all the Jews. So in the background and between the lines and actually in within the words it's themselves of the Merila, we we see, we hear that there was in fact very real debate and even probably rancorous debate and discussion and and accusations and machloketh between uh, different factions within the Jewish people as to how to go about approaching this this Torah concept, this idea of introducing a new hug and uh, formulating a new hova, a new obligation for Jews to read the Megillah every year and to celebrate in a certain way every year. It's not 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 the case that such things are accepted. Without, without debate in the Jewish people, because by and large, the Torah is based on Masoreth, on tradition. And we do this year what we did last year and the year before that. And we are always wary of Hidushim and Hadshani. But it is also a fact that sometimes Hidushim and Hadshani are necessary to to respond in the in the correct way to a new reality to a new re situation and if all of this reminds you again of uh, some of the things that go on in, in the Jewish world today again I don't think that you would be mistaken in uh, seeing these uh, this parallel I mentioned at the beginning and I will end with this thought that Mordechai was there was a connection between the the return of some of the Jewish people to Eretz Yisrael sometime before these events of Purim, and Mordechai and his 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 presence in the Persian court, because even before he was promoted to this very high position, and he replaced Haman, even before this, we see that Mordechai was present. He was around. He was in the in the palace courtyard. He was involved he was uh, he wasn't a stranger to the persian uh, to the persian court and to the, the the machinations and workings of the empire so what was Mordechai doing there what was his job why, why was he there in the first place i think another largely overlooked and misunderstood aspect of purim is the fact that the return of Am Yisrael to Eretz Yisrael, the return of the Jewish people to their ancestral homeland at that time, or a couple of generations before, three generations before that time, was a very hot topic in the Persian Empire. We know this for a fact from Sefer Ezra and Nehemiah, where we see that, as I mentioned before, the Goyim roundabout were very upset and displeased to put it mildly with the return of these pesky Jews who were getting in the way and and, uh, and wanted to rebuild the wall of, of the Homa, the wall around Yerushalayim and they were built, rebuilding the Mikdash which is of course what they had been allowed to do 
but eventually Koresh died, another king came along and, and uh, another decree was, was issued uh, preventing them from continuing this work. There was a lot of political machination and intrigue connected with the return of the Jewish people to Eretz Yisrael, just as things are today, exactly the same reality as, as it was 100 years ago and was, as it was 30 years ago and as it is today and as it will be in, in, in a year or 30 years from now as well. Because the Jewish people always have enemies, particularly when it comes to the Jewish people returning to where they belong, which is not necessarily what certain other groups and peoples and nations uh, really have in mind. It's not, 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 it's not in their interests, shall we say. And the Persian Empire, which was the reigning power, within that Persian Empire, within the court, there were different factions. Haman, in my view, was the, the head of that faction, which wanted to prevent the Jews really putting down roots and re-establishing themselves in Eretz Yisrael. He is referred to as Haman Ha'al-Hari, a descendant of the uh, Amalekim. But all, all of the enemies of, of the Jewish people uh, formed a faction. They didn't, you don't have to be an Amaleki necessarily in the biological sense to not want the Jews to return to their villages and towns in Eretz Yisrael and to reestablish themselves. As we read again in the Tanakh, in Ezra, in the Hamia, there were the Shomronim and the Kufim and various nations and groups and tribes that had invaded and overtaken parts of the country. And they had their representatives in the in their Shtadlanim. They had their... Um, <clears throat> They had their lobbyists in, in the Persian court, just as today there's a, there's a Jewish lobby in, in, in the United States, in the, American, in the American political machine, and there are, there are pro-Arab, uh, pro-Iranian, um, pro all kinds of lobby, lobby, lobbyists and lobbies and interests, and there's lots of money involved and lots of uh, intrigue and uh, goings on backwards and forwards, exactly the same thing was happening in, in those times. Mordechai was the representative, was the lobbyist for the Jews, and Haman was the lobbyist for the enemies of the Jews, and that is why they couldn't stand each other. And Haman also, on top of all of this, decided that if possible, he would also uh, put an end to this entire debate, as it were, with these Jews who are a tremendous nuisance and causing trouble and uh, working against his interests and the interests of his people and, and his allies by, by simply wiping them out. And that, is, that essentially is the story of Purim. So I hope that uh, with this information, Purim before you, this year Purim will perhaps take on a different aspect from what it was perhaps in the minds of, of many people yeah, until having perhaps heard these, these this shiur, these, these sources, and having understood them as we have explained, explained them today. Kol tov lachem. I wish you all the best. Purim Sameach. And Hizku. We are Mesle Vavchem Kol Amei Harim Thank you so much, Rabbi Shalom, shalom. Hey, Shushan Purim Sameach to you. Kol tov. Shalom. Although I, I no longer live in Yerushalayim, so I do not celebrate. Oh, you'll be uh, celebrating the same day as us. Same day as you, correct. <laughs> Call to. I, I, Call cannot, to. I cannot end the session, but someone else has to. Okay, and I think Asli Hood is trying to arrange if there are any questions. Yeah, uh, do you want to take questions, Rabbi? Well, I'll take a couple of questions if there are. Okay. Um, Daniel has one. Uh, Shalom, Rav. I sent this question uh, in the chat, but I can just ask it on here. My question was, to which extent the story of Purim should be taken literally and historically, as opposed to, for example, something that occurred in the spiritual realm, 
or may be interpreted as allegory? First of all, explain why you or someone else might imagine that su such a, a Merila written in such detail, why would someone imagine that this is an allegory rather than referring to real events? We, we had a class um, given, and, and there was an example given of this. I know what he's talking about. Go on. Go on. Well, for example, uh, Adam and Chava in Sefer Breshit, um, some say that they interacted literally with a Nachash, and some say that their interaction didn't occur physically in the material realm, but in the spiritual one. And their story is also written in great detail, both in the uh, Torah Shebikhtav, and it is also referenced in the Torah Shebalve. So inferring from that, I'm not really sure uh, what to make of Megillat Esther as a text. I, I personally do not see any any possible room for comparison between uh, what we find in, in uh, Sefer Bereshith with regards to Adam and Hawa, which is written in a, uh, in, 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 a in an ahistorical context. It's not, uh, doesn't relate to any historical events to which we can refer that we, with which we are familiar. And yes, there is definitely room, as uh, some, of the, uh, some of our great rabbis and sages have pointed out, there is room to understand that, perhaps in an allegorical sense. And there is reason to do so. I would also point out that it's not nearly the same amount of detail. You're talking there about something that's re related in, in uh, a few tens, perhaps, of Pesukim at the most, whereas uh, in the, the Merilav Hester, you're talking about nine chapters. Uh, you're talking about hundreds of Pesukim. Merilav Hester describes, in my view, very real historical events. I know that there are people of different stripes and different types who have suggested otherwise. I'm familiar with this claim, but I, I do not see any, any basis or, or reason to, to entertain such thoughts. We know there was a Persian empire. We know that the Jews, <clears throat> we know that the Jews were permitted by Koresh approximately, assuming that we know when Ahasuerosh reigned, and I think we do, roughly the mid uh, fifth century Laminyana, according to their calculations, uh, Goyish calculations. So approximately three generations before that time, uh, Koresh permitted the Jews to return to, to Yerushalayim, to Eretz Yisrael, to rebuild the Mikdash. This is related, these events are also related to the Tanakh, that it actually took place. The Jews, some Jews, not maybe as many as should have, but uh, some Jews returned in the, uh, in, the, in the original return and later with Ezra and, and later with Nehemiah. That was the beginning of the, that was the seed that eventually blossomed into the uh, period of, of the Bayt Shani, the Second Temple period, when the Jews became very numerous indeed in Eretz Israel. Initially, there were only a few tens of thousands of Jews as recorded in Sefer Ezra. We know all this is very real. We know when Ahasuerosh lived, give or take. There are There is discussion about that as well, but I think it's, it's fairly clear when he lived. There was such a king. We know which king this was. We know that there were... Uh, there, was, there was great rivalry and... and uh, and dislike and downright hatred and and even attempts to physically attack the Jews when who were rebuilding the walls of Yerushalayim as described in Sefer Nehemiah. We know we know all of this to be true. Uh, Nehemiah is 
roughly around the same time as Mordechai. <clears throat> and I think if you just read the Mirmila with a, with, a, with your eyes wide open, and you put you, with all these facts that we've mentioned in the background, I think it becomes very obvious that Mordechai was was a lobbyist for the Jewish cause, and Haman was was uh, part of the anti-Jewish faction, and he rose to a, a very high position, and uh, he have immediately tried to misuse his power uh, to uh, to uh, destroy the Jews and destroy their political aspirations as well, because he was an Arari, he was a descendant of ancient enemies of the Jewish people. And, even, and if you wish to claim that he wasn't actually a descendant of these ancient enemies, these Amalekim of the Jewish people, well then that only goes to, uh, that only forces one to draw another an additional and even more far-reaching conclusion. And this is a, a statement that Rabbeinu Hagaon, Rabbi Yosef Dov HaLewi Soloveitchik Zetzal writes in, in, the, in the book Ish Haimuna, The Man of Faith, the name of his father, Hagaon, Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik, that Amal- Amalek is not a biological uh, reality. It is not does not refer to a particular uh, racial group, but rather any any staunch, bitter, and determined enemy of the Jewish people who make it their business to destroy the Jews, who make it plain, who state in their own words that we wish to kill the Jews and destroy them and, and uh, not allow them to have their their country, their sovereign country in, in their homeland. We wish to drive them into the sea, etc., etc. Any such people are to be seen as having the halachic definition. This is not a drasha that Rav Soloveitchik was stating. Rav Soloveitchik was not a person who made drashas. He didn't give he didn't give over voting. Rav Soloveitchik was an ish halacha, another one of his books by that very name, ish halacha, ish emuna. He thought in halachic uh, terms. He was an ish halacha. He was a, a gaon atzum and a very profound Gaon, and he saw and, and explained this concept of Amalek as referring to any any group of of Oyevim Muvhakim of the Jewish people in all, in all generations. And he explicitly says that at that time, in, 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 he, when he made this, uh, when he gave this speech in which he said that he gave this shiur, when he gave these, uh, when he mentioned these ideas, this was in 1956, the time of the Suez Crisis. And he says in earlier years, in the 30s and the 40s, it was the Nazis and the Germans and their, and their associates. And today he said it's, it's Nasser and the Mufti and, and, uh, and their associates. Uh, there is no need to to belabor the point, the 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 halachic truth of this statement, I think, is is overwhelming when it is understood and perceived correct uh, with an open mind and an open heart. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers: if you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.